Hm. Ich heiße Elin und gehöre. Ups. Ich heiße Elin und gehöre zur Gemeinde von St. James the Less. Ich begrüße unsere Freunde in Deutschland zu diesem Gottesdienst. Es ist schön, dass Hannah und ihre Familie sind bei uns. Ich hoffe, es gefällt Ihnen und dass ihr zu Hause fühlt. Das Predigt wird auf Englisch leider sein, aber ich könnte das Text hinschicken nachher, wenn ihr wollt. Most of you know that I am Aileen, but for those who don't speak German, I'm Aileen, I belong to St. James. Whoops, and I need to stand back a bit. <laughs> Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I was a little bit of an anomaly. You Probably most people would say that still, but um, I was raised in the Church of Scotland, but my parents had decided not to baptize me as a child. I didn't feel particularly unloved or unaccepted though. Um, when I was about 12, I joined the church, which is the equivalent to um, confirmation in the Episcopal Church. Um, normally in the Church of Scotland, you tend to be an adult when you join the church. My minister at the time never thought to ask whether I had been baptized. Normally, when you're confirmed or you join the church, you re it's a repeating of your baptismal vows that, as a baby, are made on your behalf. But no one asked me, and I was only 12. I didn't really think about it at the time. So I joined the church. I later on went on to become an elder, and no one ever, you know, it really wasn't a thing. I hadn't been baptized, but, well, I didn't really mind. It was a bit of a talking point, but, you know, I didn't feel not part of the church. Forward um, a number of years to me joining St. James, um, years later, even after I had baptized my own babies, um, sitting in the pew week after week, part of the Eucharist prayer um, on, where is it, on page 13, help us who are baptized into the fellowship of Christ's body. I would say this week after week, and it started to get at me. I hadn't been baptized. So, um, so 13 years and five days ago, on the 7th of June, 2009, here at St. James, I was baptized. So I and Hannah have something in common, part of the community of God, and I've never looked back. Um, this is Trinity Sunday, as Paul um, had men mentioned, in German, Dreifaltigkeitssonntag. And as Paul mentioned last week, he likes to get other people to preach on this particular Sunday. The one Sunday in the year we look at church doctrine rather than an event in the story of Jesus and the early church. Guess who drew the short straw? The Trinity, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. What do we know? Three in one, one in three. Our Christian faith is based somehow on our understanding of the Trinity. What, um, um, it's one of those things that differentiates us Christians from other major faiths. But even though we all use the words in liturgy week after week, and we've used them in the baptism um, liturgy earlier, what do we actually mean? How do we understand it? Well, I was comforted to know, as I did my research this week, that it's all a bit of a mystery. But that's okay. Theologians have been trying to get their heads around the concept of the Trinity for many years. And we can talk about it too. But the good news is, we don't actually have to understand it. I don't know whether you remember the film in the 90s called Nuns, and, Nuns on the Run. There's a great scene in it with uh, Robbie Coltrane explaining the Trinity to Eric Idle. If you haven't seen it, it's on YouTube. Just Google Nuns on the Run Trinity and you'll find it. 
maybe we should have watched it here, but I'm not going to dwell long on it. Suffice to say, Eric Idle gets totally bamboozled with Robbie Coltrane's baffling explanation. The doctrine of the Trinity is an attempt by limited human beings to use limited words and concepts to speak of a reality that is infinitely and simply beyond ourselves. We don't have the words we need to describe God. This is as true today as it has been since the beginning of time. It's difficult to put an experience of God into words. As one writer wrote, we speak of the Trinity not because we understand it, and certainly not because it's an exercise in logic, but because, however poorly, it describes something about the way God reveals God's self to us, and it seems real. All our language about God is image or metaphor. How could it be anything else? When we try to explain the unfathomable, we need to take words that mean something to us and stretch them. In the Bible, God is described in so many ways. Word, spirit, cloud, glory, wisdom, light, shepherd, king, father, and the list goes on. And yet the church chose to focus on father, son, and Holy Spirit. And while these terms can be difficult for some, particularly that of Father, they are still powerful and worth looking at. The doctrine of the Trinity was formulated towards the end of the fourth century and has been widely discussed and disputed. Something that I read this week suggested that we should approach it backwards, starting with the power of the Holy Spirit, promised in the passage we read in John's Gospel, we can receive God, we can receive Jesus as God's surprising and unexpect, unexpected Messiah, who then in turn reveals to us the gracious and loving nature of God the Father. Holy Spirit, Son and Father. It, it, it doesn't quite roll off the tongue as easily as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, though. So, through the Spirit, or advocate, teacher, and bringer of peace, that Paul spoke about last week, last week was Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, um, um, we can learn about and experience the love of God that was brought to the world by Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And through Jesus, we learn about the nature of God. Jesus taught us to address God directly. Prior to that, in the Old Testament, Father is a simile, a like word. God was described as being like a father. Jesus even used the term Abba in Aramaic, which is much closer to dad or daddy, much more intimate. Because of Jesus, we Christians stopped speaking about God in the same way as the Jewish faith spoke about God. God as father, as parent, not just like a father. Metaphor replaced simile. Jesus gave us an intimacy of connection to God. And by doing that, he established and expanded forever our understanding of God. For most of us who have good thoughts or memories of our own loving fathers, this is an adequate way to address God. For those who haven't had the benefit of a positive paternal relationship and find God as father difficult, choose a different way of addressing and talking about God. God is big enough and won't mind. The theologian Sally McFaig suggested God as mother, lover, and friend. 
New metaphors can certainly help give substance to new ways of conceiving God appropriately for our time. Whatever metaphors we use, the relationships that we have with three parts of God call out and express different parts of our own faith. To relate to each of these persons is to bring greater wholeness to our knowing of God. And yet we still need to acknowledge the Trinity as one as we experience God in the individual persons of the Trinity, so we experience God as whole, as unity. God is one and God is three. Still a bit confused, though. <laughs> God in relationship with God and God in relationship with us. However we choose to speak to and about God, we continually discover the idea that God is essentially social. The Trinity isn't a formula, it's an expression of everything we experience about God and reality. And because we are made in the image of God, we cannot become the people God has made us to be in isolation. We are a people called to travel together as community. As community, we are called to celebrate common life and depth of differences, speaking out for justice and proclaiming the good news. As community, we draw out, we reach out to draw all peoples into its embrace. We've done that today in joy as we baptized Hannah. We promise to welcome her, care for her, and share our faith with her. We also promised to live and work for the kingdom of God, which is what God calls us to do in the community. We live in hope, and this is not a vain hope. We can be confident because, as we read in Romans, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, and God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. The Trinity is a God-given insight into the nature of the way things are, of the way we are, of the way God is. Trinity is the model for divine life and the model for our own lives. The image is individual and personal and communal and dynamic. It connects and transforms. It saves. In the name of the Father and Mother, Son and Lover, Holy Spirit and Friend. Amen.